Hello there. Good evening. I'm Julie Moore, Communications Director with the Trust. Thank you all so much for joining the Trust this evening. We're thrilled you can be here for our November Women's Leadership Committee Seasonal Series. Now, for those of you who are new to the Trust, um, we are the nonprofit philanthropic partner of the National Park Service that works to restore, preserve, and enrich the National Mall. A bit of housekeeping, I'll be collecting questions for our lecturer this evening, so you can drop any questions at any time into the chat or the Q&A function, and we'll get through as many as possible. And now I'm so pleased to welcome Trust for the National Mall President and CEO, Catherine Townsend, who will get our evening underway. Catherine? Thank you, Julie. Thank you everyone for joining. We have an incredible group here tonight and we have an incredible speaker. So I just wanna thank everyone and welcome everyone. The Trust, National, the Trust for the National Mall's Women's Leadership Committee is one of our most committed and engaged groups and a driving force behind our work on the National Mall. Many of the members are here with us tonight, so welcome. And thank you for your longstanding support. Um, we're so glad to have you with us. Tonight's presentation is generously sponsored by one of our Women's Leadership Committee members, Judith Fritz. So thank you, Judith, so much for making this evening possible and bringing Dr. Edward Lingall with us tonight. Uh, we're always looking to bring new members into the fold. So um, we hope that uh, more people that are new to the trust tonight might be interested in looking, checking us out. Check out our website at nationalmall.org and learn more about our work, learn about how you can join our Women's Leadership Committee, our Ambassador Council, and other ways to support our, our work. Especially, this is an important time for the Trust as we work to help the National Park Service prepare for the, prepare the National Mall for the 250th anniversary of our nation's founding, which is coming up in five years in 2026. It will sure be a momentous occasion on the National Mall. So again, to learn more, check out our website, nationalmall.org. We are excited to see so many great people from all around the country. We've got folks joining from Florida and California and Connecticut, as well as around the Washington, D.C. area, and of course, from Texas. Um, last week on Veterans Day, the National Mall paid tribute beautifully to the men and women and military heroes who have served our nation, including events at the World War II Memorial and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We are so pleased to have a noted military historian with us this evening to talk about the military history and leadership of George Washington, and also to talk about the precedent set by, set by George Washington as a military leader and as a founder of our nation. Increasingly interesting to consider as we move toward the 250th anniversary of America's founding in 2026. I am so pleased to introduce Dr. Edward Lengel, he is an award-winning author and Washington, George Washington expert. He has authored books on military history, including General George Washington and Military Life. Dr. Lengel was the co-recipient of the National Humanities Medal for his work on George Washington's papers. He currently serves as the Chief Historian of the Medal of Honor Museum in Arlington, Texas. Dr. Lengel, we are so grateful to have you here with us this evening and excited for you to share your expertise with us about one of our most famous founding fathers. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Edward Lengel. Good evening. Thank you to Catherine Townsend. Thank you, Catherine, for that great introduction. I want to also give a shout out to Julie Moore. It's a great honor to be with you this evening. I was just delighted when I received the invitation. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Chief Historian of the National Medal of Honor Museum in Arlington, Texas, but I actually grew up in Arlington, Virginia, because I'm a DC native. People say there's no such thing as a DC native, but uh, I am. I was born at George Washington Hospital in DC, grew up in the area, went to elementary, middle school, high school, went to George Mason University. Uh, and then the University of Virginia. I remember well uh, going in when I was eight years old, when it was possible to do that, uh, just going out alone and hopping on the metro and riding into uh, D.C. and wandering up and down the mall by myself, uh, particularly going to the National Air and Space Museum. But I also remember very well uh, attending the Bicentennial in 1976 and all the crowds and all the the hoopla and what a wonderful time and wonderful event that was. So I'm excited that uh, we are building up toward uh, America 250 
and the semi-quincentennial celebrations that uh, we will be engaging in then. And so the Trust for the National Mall and America 250 and other organizations are doing such great work to, uh, to prepare the way uh, for that great event. So I'm, so I'm very excited about that as well. So uh, I spent most of my time in the DC area, then uh, went to the University of Virginia and actually studied British history at the University of Virginia in graduate school, which I guess might normally incline me to become a Tory. But since uh, I graduated uh, from UVA, I got the opportunity right out of graduate school to go and work for the George Washington Papers and then spent really the next 20 years of my career studying George Washington's correspondence, George Washington's life, every aspect of the man. He was somebody who I never expected I would get to know well. I really didn't think that I would be studying the Founding Fathers at all. But for me, the, the entrance to that field was gaining an understanding of George Washington as a human being. And in some ways, there's really no better means of doing that than, than reading somebody's mail, than reading their day-to-day -day existence, learning about their everyday concerns, preoccupations, motivations, deepest thoughts, the things that they share with the public, but also the things that they share in private. So everything from personal correspondence to official correspondence gave me a sense of how Washington changed over time. And it was ironic. I actually started with working on the, the correspondence of Washington's retirement right toward the end of his life when he was engaging in a number of business enterprises at Mount Vernon, looking forward hopefully toward the 19th century, getting his whiskey distillery started up and uh, doing many other things, but also facing the possibility of an invasion from France and being called back out to the field to command the army and, and to face down a possible invasion. But then from there, I moved back toward the beginning and really spent most of my time studying George Washington in the Revolutionary War. So I've written several books about George Washington, but I think that two books in particular that I wrote trace my evolving understanding of Washington as a leader and particularly as a military leader. And those were General George Washington, A Military Life, which was published in 2005. And then First Entrepreneur, How George Washington Built His and the Nation's Prosperity, which was published in 2016. And First Entrepreneur, well, let me get back to General George Washington, that really looked at Washington solely as a soldier, solely as uh, somebody who, who lived in the military, became a military leader, how his evolving understanding of military affairs changed over his life. But then first entrepreneur looked at Washington as a businessman or more broadly how Washington understood money and the economy. And it was, it was interesting as I wrote the second book, it provided really pretty profound new insights and understandings on how Washington viewed warfare and how Washington viewed his sense of leadership. And, and it surprised me in many respects, how the two different areas intertwine from his understanding of military affairs, his understanding of, of money, and how that translated into his understanding of politics and, and leadership. So I'll try to give this evening a, a brief sense of how that worked and how, how that evolved over the course of his life. I think one of the first and most fundamental things to, to understand with Washington is that he was a combat veteran. That was something that he experienced fairly early in his life when he was only 23 years old at the Battle of the Monongahela, also known as Braddock's defeat during the French and Indian War. Now, Washington grew up in relative affluence. 
Uh, his father died, as, as just about everybody knows, when, when Washington was only 11 years old. His father was a businessman, the, somebody who, who was very, very entrepreneurial in his own mind. And his mother, Mary, Mary Ball Washington, was the one who was charged with raising him. She decided not to send him to a private school or a private tutor, as, as many did at the time, but rather to, to educate him at home. So he was a homeschooled president, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and she taught him basic fundamentals of practical principles that he would need to get by in life and to become an estate manager. Things like prudence, sobriety, diligence, uh, morality, uh, and all the rest. And she really gave him the fundamental principles on, on which he, he built his life. Washington then, much against his, his mother's uh, preferences, went off to serve in the French and Indian War. And uh, he had a number of adventures. Uh, most of them didn't end very well, particularly at the beginning and escapades such as Fort Necessity in 1754, when uh, Washington's command of a fort in Western Pennsylvania ended in, in ignominy and disaster as it was surrounded and attacked by the French, he was forced to surrender really in, in the most abject circumstances and then retreat. In 1755, Washington signed on as an aide de camp to British General Edward Braddock as he launched an expedition again back into Western Pennsylvania uh, to try to rouse the French out of the area. Now, Washington was part of General Braddock's column as it approached the Monongahela River in July of 1755. This column was suddenly attacked on multiple sides. And in a trice, Washington was the only unwounded um, not really an officer because he didn't hold rank as an aide de camp, but the only individual in a leadership position who either hadn't been wounded or killed. So he had to take charge of the army, try to try to keep the, the military force together, carry General Braddock, who is mortally wounded, off the field and try to retreat to safety. He behaved with exemplary bravery. He showed his, his physical bravery under, on this occasion. He was shot at from all sides. Uh, it was said, according to legend, that multiple musket balls passed through, passed through his coat. He had a couple of horses shot out from under him, but he was never wounded. But there's no question that there were, I don't think it's too much to say some psychological wounds uh, that, that stayed with Washington from that encounter. He was not a man who was inclined to, to much nostalgia. He didn't talk often about the past as he got older, but, but this was one episode he did talk about. And he mentioned in an annotation to some memoirs that were written by a guy named David Humphreys while George Washington was still alive, a, kind of the first effort at a biography of Washington. Washington penned in the, uh, in the margins how he would never forget the, the sounds in particular of that night as the army withdrew from the field and the cries of the wounded and, and the sense of terror that, that swept over this force. He understood them and through his subsequent, his subsequent service in the war, really the, the extremes to which combat service can take an individual and can take an organization. And this is something that had a really a huge impact on Washington throughout throughout his career. And I'm going to get to that, going to get to that in a moment. It's often said that that Washington's service in the French and Indian War taught him basic principles of administration. That's true. Basic principles of leadership of men. That's true. And, and it was a rough process for him because he was not a very effective leader initially. He, he got in a lot of got in a lot of trouble early on and made some poor decisions. Uh, it's said that, that it taught him organizational skills uh, and many other things. But I think one thing that, that tends to get overlooked is it taught Washington about war. What is war? What does war do? What does it do to men? What does it do to societies? What does it do to communities? And how do you maintain 
focus of any society, any community on, on war and on a war effort and on the need to achieve victory in a war. It's, it's not something that's easy to understand. And, and I think if we keep in mind, Washington's contemporaries tended to be either purely military, people like, like General Braddock, who thought exclusively in military and tactical terms, or people like as, as the, United, the, the fledgling United States moved toward independence, people like Patrick Henry, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, who certainly had a great understanding of politics and were great intellectuals, but understood nothing about war and understood nothing about what war does. Now, if we move forward a bit, of course, George marries Martha Washington right at the end of the French and Indian War. She has a profound impact on his life. I think she gives him center focus. He's very family focused. He's very estate focused. She chose him as much as he chose her. Uh, she chose him because he seemed steady and sober and somebody who would be devoted and a great caretaker to her children. They didn't have any children together, but to her children and to her estate. And, and he certainly proved that to be a case, to be the case. Now, Washington, and I don't have time to get into this now, but as Washington develops the Mount Vernon estate, he's very focused on the economic and business side of the development of that estate. He proves to be very adept at it. But as the colonies move toward a conflict with Great Britain, in the late 1760s and early 1770s, it's, quick, it's crucial to understand that Washington saw this conflict almost entirely in economic terms. To him, the, the root of the difference between the United States and Great Britain was that, or the, the what would become the United States between America and Great Britain, was that America and Americans were on the verge of achieving takeoff economic takeoff, that they were on the verge of getting on the path toward uh, establishing their own prosperity, their own wealth, the future and security of their society. And he felt that oppressive British regulations, everything from monetary regulations to trade and many other things, really suppressed that and really kept Americans in what he believed in what he called a kind of slavery and, and kept them in a, in a degraded state and prevented them from, from achieving prosperity because to him, the ability to achieve economic prosperity, the ability to work upon one's own behalf and to, to become self-sufficient was also the key to, to moral living. It was the key toward toward being a, uh, an upstanding and civilized individual. And it was interesting that, that it, was, it was that dynamic and that belief that would eventually turn him against the, the institution of slavery later in his life as he began to think about it more. But for now, in, in the 1770s, he thinks about it in economic terms. And right up until uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord in early 1775, Washington is still hoping that the, uh, that the conflict between America and Great Britain will be solely economic in nature. He does not seek a military conflict. He expects by that point there's going to be an economic war but he doesn't expect it to move beyond that. He hopes that it will end in victory. Once though blood is shed and once he sees and accepts the fact that, that men are drilling around him uh, all over Virginia and all over the rest of the, the colonies and preparing for conflict, shots have been fired, Americans have been killed, redcoats have been killed. Washington recognizes that he has to embrace the fact that this is going to be an armed conflict. Now, here's where we get into a realm of a lot of misunderstanding of, of Washington as a leader. If we move into June of 1775, as Congress, Continental Congress is debating who they're going to choose to lead the Continental Army, who is going to lead the country uh, in, this, in this great war, Washington legendarily, he comes to the Second Continental Congress 
wearing his military uniform. Now, the, the usual and I think shallow interpretation of that is that Washington really wants the job. He wants everybody to see, hey, look at me, I'm a soldier. I can take command. I know what to do. You should put me in charge. I think nothing is further from the truth. I think Washington's own personal moral concept was that any man of virtue must put himself at the service of his country, at the service of his community, in any capacity in which he is able. That's his concept of humility, is you look yourself in the mirror and you see where you are ineffective, where you really shouldn't go, what you really shouldn't try to do, but also where you are effective, where you can work effectively and be and achieve something on behalf of your community. Washington knew that of all the leaders surrounding him, there were none really who combined either some basic political and economic ability with the understanding of military command and the understanding particularly of war and how war impacts society. His putting on his uniform was a statement, I'm here to serve, this is the best way I can serve, I will serve in any capacity you think right. Uh, he was not asking for command. Uh, that is what he received, but he was not necessarily asking for command. When he is uh, mentioned by John Adams and he is voted, the Congress votes that Washington will become commander in chief of the Continental Army, he's besieged by doubts. He's really not sure that he's going to succeed. And, and if you look and how the odds are stacked, you have to sympathize with him. I mean, Britain had all the advantages, uh, but for him particularly, it was the economic advantages that counted. He believed that Britain had the staying power to ride out this war and that the fledgling United States did not. Now, another legend you hear about Washington is that he was a Fabian warrior, that he was trying to conduct a guerrilla campaign to outlast the British uh, to, to simply wear them down. That's an interpretation that really dates for the most part from the Vietnam War era. And, and it was not something that dated from Washington's conception at the time. Washington wanted this war to end as quickly as possible. He thought that, he thought that the primary purpose of this war was to achieve economic freedom so that Americans could achieve economic prosperity. If you conduct a war that is devastating to your country's economy, as a guerrilla war would be, that is destructive to society, that's destructive to trade, that is destructive to everything that, that allows you to build prosperity, then essentially you're, you're conducting a scorched earth campaign. You may win victory ultimately, but you'll be sitting on a heap of ashes at the end. So his goal was to end the war as quickly as possible, first of all, but also to conduct a war that would have as, as slight an impact on the American people economically as possible. He was always working to protect Americans and everyday Americans uh, from day to day from having to deal with the economic consequences of conducting a war. He wasn't always successful. But he certainly tried to prevent the army from plundering, from requisitioning, everything else. That was, that was an ap absolute pillar of his understanding of leadership and military strategy during the war. The army was there to fight for the people. The army was not something separate from the people with its own interests, but it was there for the people. And that was how, that was how he conducted the war. Now, I'd like to focus in, in the remainder of the time that I have left on, on a few points, a few vignettes that get to the key of his leadership and his understanding of courage, valor, dedication, uh, these concepts that we highlight at the National Medal of Honor Museum and all the rest. At the, uh, at the low point, one of the lowest points of the Revolutionary War, the Continental Army entered a place called Valley Forge. It was a the winter of 1777 to 78, it was a terrible encampment. All of you have heard about it. The 
the lack of food, the lack of basic supplies, the disease, the suffering and starvation that spread through the army where of an army of about 10,000, perhaps 2,000 perished, which is pretty devastating. Washington's entire concept of personal conduct during this encampment was focused on the idea that he was there to work. He was not there to give rousing speeches. He was not there to show off his pretty uniform. He was not there to go out and try to lead his men in battles that they would be unlikely to win. But his job there was to take care of the soldiers to give them the basic needs that they had to have in order to survive, first of all, and then in order to be able to do their jobs. His example of hard work and dedication, staying there all through the encampment, where Martha stayed too, by the way, and also set a great example, working day and night on all the details. This is something I saw from reading his papers in, in that period set a tremendous example to, to his uh, service members and their admiration of his willing to give of himself selflessly on their behalf was what translated their respect and obedience to him into absolute love. And you can see this in how the troops react to him in battles that took place after Valley Forge. Battles before Valley Forge, they'll obey him if he gives commands, Battles after Valley Forge, if he appears on the field at a crisis moment, all of their fears dissipate. They begin cheering. They have a sense George Washington is here. He's going to take care of us. Moving forward through many more events, this understanding, Washington's basic understanding as a combat veteran of warfare, his, his ability to lead the army, to lead selflessly, kind of reaches its, its apogee in March of 1783 when the army encamps at a place called Newburgh, New York. Uh, Valley, I mean, uh, Yorktown has already taken place. The British have already, uh, Cornwallis has already surrendered at Yorktown in October of 1781, but the war isn't over yet. Negotiations are still taking place in Paris. They're, they're reaching their end, but nobody really knows what's going on dissatisfaction in the army has reached a crisis point. This is something that people had been fearing from the very beginning of the revolution. Uh, the civilians had feared that the army would become a force in and of itself, that it would seek to impose a dictatorship, that it would tend to follow its own interests. And the army uh, officers and men for their part had become increasingly suspicious of Congress, increasingly suspicious, not just of Congress, but of civilians in general. This is something you can see that has happened in, in every American war. It tends to create a division in society between those who have served and those who have not served. And the longer that war takes place, the greater that division grows. Never was that more true than at the end of the, than at the, end of the American Revolution. Certain individuals, agitators within the army, but also outside the army, began to circulate uh, petitions saying that, in effect, and I'm, I'm really simplifying here, but uh, for lack of time, we'll focus on, on the main things. They argued that Congress had betrayed the army, that Congress was not providing pensions, was not providing support for soldiers and their families, that Congress had simply used them and sacrifice them on the battlefield and now is abandoning them to poverty uh, and starvation and that they would really have no future after they return home. But they also said, these petitioners also said that American civilians have let you down. You no, know, the family you left at home have betrayed you. The communities you came from have betrayed you. And they argued that the army should march on Congress and impose its will at the point of the bayonet or if they were unwilling to do that, simply withdraw into the country and let the British occupy uh, America as, as they saw fit. It, it was unbelievable, but, it, but the amazing thing about it was how popular it was. The one thing that pulled it together and, and the late great historian Don Higginbotham called George Washington the linchpin of the American Revolution. And I think here is, is where he meant that Washington steps into this gap and he is the one man 
in the entire country who can pull the two ends together. And, and what he does is really superhuman, but it's also very simple. When he appears before the soldiers, he gives a very passionate and very emotional speech to the officers and uh, talks to them about their duty, why they fought, everything else. But he comes in the end in the simple gesture of putting on his spectacles, which he's never worn in public before, and um, turning to the officers assembled and saying, uh, gentlemen, I have grown gray in your service. I now find myself growing blind. That has such a powerful effect. But if you think about it, the putting on of spectacles is the least warlike gesture that anybody could possibly make. That doesn't say I'm going to battle. That says I'm sitting at my desk and I'm working. And that's what Washington was calling them to. He was saying, I worked on your behalf, not for glory, but for the basic things that you needed to do your job and to stay alive. That kind of selfless leadership, that willingness to give of himself was what turned the tide and convinced the officers to put their total trust in Washington and not to march on Congress. Uh, and it's one of the great moments in the history of our country. I do not think Washington ever had an opportunity to become king. I think that's exaggerated, but he could have become a military dictator. The agitators were hoping that he would lead them but he was able to quell that agitation with one simple gesture and save our democracy in the process. One final point that I'll make about, about Washington and then, uh, then I'll uh, get to my conclusion is that as Washington moves on through the Confederation era and then he becomes president of the United States, we hear many things uh, about Washington as president uh, and many things about his leadership and I think most of them are beside the point. There were two things that he sought. One of them he said right before he, he entered office in 1789, he wrote in a private letter uh, to a family member, if, if my memory serves me right, he says to, to gain the national prosperity shall be my first and my only aim. To, to guard, to achieve national prosperity shall be my first and my only aim. That's, that's putting it very directly. To achieve that prosperity, the second point that he pursued above all other things was peace. George Washington, the man of war, George Washington who had been through combat, George Washington who, who had led the army through the Revolutionary War was our greatest military leader. But George Washington, the combat veteran, and I've always believed that if you want to find the people who understand war the best, look for the combat veterans. But also, if you want to find individuals who understand and value peace the most, turn toward your veterans because they understand it better than anybody else among us. Washington's understanding of the value of peace, the importance of protecting prosperity for the people led him to avoid on multiple occasions people who were trying, trying to drag the country into war. So what do we take from all this? What kind of inspiration do we draw from all of this? Yeah, we, we certainly conclude that Washington was a great man. There's no question about it, that, that Washington was a great leader, that he was an inspiration, that he set a precedent in so many ways for how our country would develop. But, but Washington, and I have Washington in my mind all the time as I work at the National Medal of Honor Museum, Washington established the values and the principles of what it means to serve one's country. Now, the National Medal of Honor Museum uh, will break ground in early 2022 and will open to the public in 2024 in, in Arlington, Texas. We're now in, in the approaching the end, uh, very hopefully, of our capital campaign to get this off the ground. It's going to be a spectacular museum. I really encourage all of you to, to come and visit when it's there. We are honoring our over 3,500 Medal of Honor recipients uh, in the many millions who have served our country. 3,500, and we have to distill that down to 50 
who we'll focus upon of of our greatest our greatest uh, service members who who have who have uh, given to our country in so many different capacities and and the medal that they received the medal of honor what what that means now, washington created something called the badge of military merit when he was when he was serving in the in the revolutionary war he created the idea of the concept of medals and uh, basic awards for valor but but that didn't really go anywhere uh, there were a handful of individuals who, who received medals, gold medals presented by Congress for their service in the war. And, and that was it. There were no military decorations until the President Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War signed uh, into law the creation of the Medal of Honor, the National Medal of Honor, which has been awarded since the Civil War up to the present day. Now, the, the principles and concepts that go into the Medal of Honor, you see uh, not only practice on the battlefield, but off the battlefield. As I've gotten to know these Medal of Honor recipients who are living, there are 66 of them left alive now. The things that, that unify them are humility, selflessness, dedication, patriotism, courage, all of these concepts that I think are so important and so inspiring today. And they are concepts that George Washington modeled in his leadership for our country. And so I think it, it brings us around full circle and, and it draws a connection to how we can still draw tremendous inspiration from the past. I'm so delighted to see what we're doing now with the, uh, the Trust for the National Mall approaching America 250. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a spectacular success as we move forward. And I uh, thank all of you for uh, hearing my talk and I look forward to any questions you may have. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was, I can't believe the time is, and you could talk another 30 minutes, I'd be. I could, it goes fast. <laughs> and I have to say our numbers keep growing up through the session. So sometimes people drop off or you're like a record breaker for us. So thank you. Um, so I think there is a, place in the chat where people can ask questions and Julie's going to gather some of those questions and join on in just a second. Um, I just thought, I just wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit about what would you say to you? What, what do you say? I know you write a lot and you talk a lot, you do a lot of speeches and a lot of work with the museum. What would you say to youth today, the young 20 somethings or kids that are, that might be young now, but when 2026 rolls around, what would you, how would you, what would be the, the themes that you would want them to know best about George Washington or our first founding? Well, they have to understand that Washington is not just a historical figure or a picture on the wall, but that he was a human being and that he was much like much like them in how how he developed. He, 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 he experienced many challenges, but there were certain fundamental ideas, concepts and principles that guided him through those challenges. It's the same thing that we're, we're trying to do in the National Medal of Honor Museum. We're going to have a gallery called The Heroes Among Us, which takes it not just from these military heroes, but to civilian heroes, the people who have, who have given to their country, their community, and really often very spectacular ways. It needs to be shown in a way that it's immediate, in a way that you can look in the mirror and say, yeah, you know, he, he went through this, and yet with these with these concepts and these principles, again, selflessness, giving, dedication, love of country, that, that you too, as I often tell young people, you too can achieve great things. George Washington was not like some superhuman person who none of you can reach, but he was just like you. you know, and you, whether you become president of the United States or you become president of your parent teacher association, or you just become a really good parent, or a really good you know, child or family member or, or whatever, you can do all kinds of amazing things. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Lumbo. Um, I want I just want to ask a little personal aside. I your uh, tell us a little bit about your tours. And uh, it looks like you've had some fun ones. And I don't know if you're still doing them in the future. Or I just think that's pretty cool. So I thought maybe the audience would love to know a little bit more about that, too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for asking. Yes, I do lead a lot of tours. 
Uh, I've led everything from tours of American Revolutionary War sites, uh, presidential homes, but I've led tours overseas. I was uh, led tours to American World War I battlefields, but I was most honored to lead a tour to Normandy on the 75th uh, anniversary of D-Day in 2019. And oh my gosh, it was the most amazing experience ever to meet some of the World War II veterans. Uh, we still have one living World War II Medal of Honor recipient, Woody Williams, still with us. He's one of the most wonderful people I've ever met. That tour was incredible. I will be leading a tour in June of next year for Stephen Ambrose tours of Medal of Honor sites in Europe, everywhere from Normandy over to Audie Murphy's site. Uh, so you stand on the ground where these things happen, where these people perform these great deeds of valor, it, it can be transformative. So there's nothing I love better. Great, thank you. So Julie, I'm gonna turn it to you and let you um, ask some of the questions. It looks like we've got some takeaways. Or nice yes, ones. terrific. Lots of, sorry, lots of comments and questions. I'm gonna to try to move quickly. I'm gonna start with a couple of comments because they're, they're really lovely. Um, wow. Um, the global war on terrorism folks are on the on the call and they're saying um, there's you know no question but wanted to say it's amazing that those qualities of leadership and selfless sacrifice that Washington embraced are still the pillars of service today uh, truly withstood the test of time. Um, here I'll, I'll, I'll start with this question in all your research Dr. Lengel and study of Washington is there anything that particularly surprised you about this man? You got to know him? Yeah, let me first respond to the, the yeah, let me first respond to the, the comment on the global war of, on terror. I've gotten to know a number of the recipients, uh, people such as uh, Will Swenson and Britt Slavinsky, and they are just incredible people. Uh, Will, I was going to say, is absolutely brilliant, one of the funniest people I've ever met. They all still maintain that same humility, but you can see how they embody those values that go straight from our very beginnings as a country right up to today. So they're incredible. Uh, in terms of things that, that surprised me about Washington, uh, I'd say his compassion probably surprised me the most because he seems so stiff and he seems so distant, but he was a very empathetic individual. He was somebody who was very sensitive to other people's feelings. He had a strong sense of charity. He had a strong sense of giving. Uh, and a strong, incredibly strong sense of responsibility uh, to help the less fortunate. Um, and I found that really remarkable in him. Great, here's another one. Did Washington create the Purple Heart Medal Award? He did not create the, the Purple Heart Medal Award. That was something that, that came much later. It was inspired by Washington. It was inspired by his, by his badge of, of military. Right? Uh, and his recognition of service members during the Revolutionary War who, who had been wounded, his dedication and sense that they needed to be recognized, but, but it was not created by Washington. Um, here's another question. At Mount Vernon, a museum panel for kids asks, who started the French and Indian War? And the answer is George Washington. Do you agree or how would you elaborate? Well, that's, it's... Um, it's one way of putting it, uh, shall we say. It's not wrong. It's not wrong necessarily because uh, before Fort Necessity, George Washington led a group of Virginia militia as well as some Native Americans to a place called Jumanville's Glen. Uh, this Native American chief called the Half King talked Washington into believing that this party of Frenchmen who were approaching him were up to no good, that were, they were preparing to attack him and he needed to attack them first. Washington was just a kid, you know, he, he didn't really know how to handle it. He led an attack on them and uh, ended up killing a bunch of them, including Ensign Jumanville, and found out after they had been killed that they were on a diplomatic mission rather than a military mission. Uh, and he fled to Fort Necessity pursued by the brother of Vincent Jumanville, who then surrounded and captured him. Uh, I think though there's a nuance to that in that tensions were already so high at that point that it wouldn't take much to set them off. And it's been suggested to me that the governor of Virginia at that time, Robert Dinwiddie sent Washington out knowing that the type of guy Washington was, he was bound to start something. 
<laughs> so I, I think there's there's some grain of, of truth to that, definitely. Here's another one. Uh, Takeaway for visitors to the Washington Monument. Take away from visitors to the Washington Monument. I've I've uh, been going to see the Washington Monument since I was a kid, and the Washington Monument, when you first glance at it, doesn't doesn't visually convey a sense of, of than humanity. You know, it's it's a great obelisk, really. Um, so it's it's hard to it's hard to reach that sense of individuality of, of Washington through the Washington Monument. But what the Washington Monument do, does do, and I think it's it's one of our great national treasures. Uh, I love the Washington Monument. It towers above Washington D.C. It towers above the Mall. It towers above the White House and Ellipse. And I would like I like to think of it as a unifying point as kind of where everything comes together that brings that that replicates Washington's Revolutionary War role as a linchpin as a unifying force. So I would like people to see the Washington Monument not just as as a monument to the achievement of one man, but as a fulcrum, you know, as as a unifying focus. Uh, and I think visually it really does serve that role. Great. Uh, in his correspondence, have you found evidence of Washington writing later in life about regrets he had about his earlier decisions? If so, can you give examples? Yes, Washington didn't, he was not really given to express regret uh, very often, uh, not in, not formally uh, in writing. You see more his expression of, of mistakes by changes in his behavior. Uh, for example, during the latter part of the French and Indian War, Washington was really a pretty uh, argumentative, uh, kind of a negative uh, individual in how he, how he served as an officer in the army. He was constantly bickering and complaining. He tended to be pulled off by interests, different factions and interest groups in one direction or another. And that was something that you can tell that he realized that he had done wrong. He got in a lot of trouble mm -hmm. by the fact that in his later military service, he specifically avoided those things. He specifically avoided any type of factionalism, any type of involvement in individual interests. He tried to stay above the fray. Uh, he tried to, to focus on fundamentals and on unifying things, but he didn't, he didn't really write um, write down. I think maybe he was afraid of what posterity might dig up uh, much in the way of regrets, but he definitely had them. Um, are there tenets of Washington's legacy that you can see follow a line and see them endure in today's military? Yes, um, I think in particular, Washington's determination not to politicize the military. Washington's determination, as I mentioned in, in the course of my, my talk, that the military should exist at the service of the people, that, that the military is an outgrowth of the will of the people and not the will of the commander in chief. Uh, I think those were fundamental tenets uh, of Washington's concept of himself as an officer and as a leader. And as we know, he, he was a, a great supporter of the Society of the Cincinnati, which, which worked to carry on those values um, that I think are really at, at the core of the military today. Um, I would add to that values that I mentioned earlier, you know, selflessness, patriotism, courage, uh, and all the rest that, that have been so magnificently embodied by our armed forces, uh, especially over the past 20 years. Do you think amidst all this humility, he had any sense of the significance of his own leadership and legacy? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, let, let me get back to what humility means and what it meant for him. When we think about humility today, we tend to think of it as kind of a self-abasement, you know, putting yourself down and um, you know, saying, I'm not good enough, don't call on me. That's false humility. 
That's not what humility is. Humility is a clear self-vision. That's how he understood it. Uh, humility is you see yourself as you are. Washington believed that providence had placed him, as he called it, had placed him in a, a extremely important position, the position that was very important to the welfare, the future welfare of his country. There was nothing messianic about that. He didn't say that God put me here because I'm the greatest. He said, providence has chosen me. He's, providence has said that, that this is my path and I must follow it to the best of my ability. As the Revolutionary War ended, he understood profoundly the huge symbolic importance of what he would do, of tendering his resignation and returning his commission uh, as commander in chief. This was not something that, that he decided on the whim of the moment. He wasn't pacing up and down uh, the sidewalk thinking, should I give it back? Shouldn't I? No, he, he understood that this was a ritual that had to be performed because Americans would look at it for decades and he hopes centuries to come for setting the precedent of, of what a military leader does. He was going through, he often compared himself to an actor on the stage, especially at this time, that I'm carrying out a role that people will watch and people will observe. And what I do is so important to the future of this country it has been preordained that I'm gonna return my commission. There's never any doubt. And his, his um, fellows in the Congress, people like Jefferson, Madison, the rest, they recognize this. Uh, they said that, that this is something he has to do. He must carry it through. So in that sense, yeah, he, he understands the huge importance of what he does, but, but there's no, no hint of arrogance in that. There's no hand of, of like self-interest uh, and self-promotion in that. That's just an acknowledgement. This is where I am. This is what I have to do. And I have to accept what, what fate has given to me. Uh, what were the incentives to join the military in 1775? That's also a, a great question. Um, the, those who would enlist did receive bounties. Uh, they would receive bounties whether they served in the militia or and which would be provided by the states or they would receive continental bounties if they enlisted in the Continental Army. They were proud, however, of not being mercenaries. For them, uh, receiving bounties and pay was a way to provide for their families, was a way to ensure that their families didn't didn't collapse into poverty when they were away fighting. Pardon me. And for many of them, it was it was a really a fine line to walk. They were they were constantly torn between, you no, know, should I keep serving or should I go home because my my wife and my family need me. Uh, it was it was rather different than it is today. So they were they were partly motivated by that. I, but I'd say in most cases, not for selfish reasons. I think there's, there's no question that the vast majority of those who enlisted, uh, whether in the militia or in the, the Continental Service, did so out of a sense of patriotism. But they continued their service for a variety of reasons. It could have been for belief in their leadership, hope of victory, but primarily a love of their comrades, a love of the people that they were fighting alongside. Uh, those became primary motivations. Yes, they did still need to be paid, and they gave, they let it be known when their pay fell massively in arrears, as it often did, but they weren't there to get rich, uh, that's for sure, and they weren't in it for plunder. Uh, they were in it for, for their families and their communities. We're going to take one last question, and that is um, best trivia for George Washington trivia buffs. Best trivia for, for George Washington trivia buffs. Uh, gosh, that, that threw me for, for a loop. Let me, let me think for a second. Uh, I'd say things like, uh, what was his most successful business enterprise? I'd say his, his whiskey distillery was amazingly successful. What type of foods did he like? Uh, I'll give you a few things I can see from his 
from his account books during the war, he really liked asparagus. He likes strawberries, he loves fish, uh, but he also liked honey. And uh, that had an impact on his, uh, on the state of his teeth. Um, but yeah, I think some, some of the things, the kinds of food that he enjoyed and what did he, what did he enjoy drinking? He liked Porter a lot. Uh, and he loved Madeira wine. Personally, I can't stand, but you know, he, he liked it. Um, but, but he enjoyed wine, especially things like that. What was his favorite pastime? What did he do when he wasn't like, when he needed a break from eating? <laughs> His favorite pastime was gardening uh, and working his farm, uh, but also uh, horseback riding. Uh, yes, he did enjoy fox hunting. Uh, he didn't do it that much. He liked to gamble uh, when he was younger. Um, Martha really put a stop to that, <laughs> which you can see in his accounts because he was losing money on cards until he got married. Uh, and it was clear that she cracked him. Um, so yeah, he liked the outdoors. Um, he read he read a fair amount, but he wasn't he wasn't a Jefferson type reader. Fabulous. Any other any other final, Julie? Any? We... That's it. I think that's all we all we've got here. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Catherine, to close us out. Thank you. Well, Dr. Lindell, this was a fabulous fabulous presentation. I, I, if there's any final comments you wanted to make, but we just I'll let you say it real quick and then I'll close this out. Just uh, final comments that I make. Thank you. Uh, the Trust for the National Mall absolutely deserves your support. Uh, <laughs> the National Mall is just wonderful, wonderful. It's a national treasure. Um, also, the National Medal of Honor Museum deserves a bit of your support too. So keep an eye on <laughs> uh, Look at our website. You can Google us uh, in Arlington, Texas. We got some great things going on. That's great. Well, thank you so, so much. This was incredibly informative. We're just proud to have you as part of our, our speaker series. And uh, again, uh, thank you to Judith for supporting this and bringing, um, having introductions and everything. We're, we're excited to work with you more over the next five years and in the future. we got a lot to do, maybe a special tour in Washington on the National Mall. Um, we'll keep you posted. And for all the all you newcomers to the trust, we hope you check out our website and learn more. We're we're just really honored to have you participate with us tonight. And again, everyone have a wonderful evening and um, until the next one. Stay tuned for our next speakers and our next monumental conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.